Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with Alice. After all, it was Alice Rogoff who really introduced my firm, uh, Guggenheim Partners, to the Arctic. And uh, now we receive uh, the Arctic today uh, in our email inboxes every morning. Actually, I get two copies of it. I'm, I'm not entirely certain why. And so I'm frequently jet lagged. And so I'll read the first one, and then I'll go to the second one. I'll say, boy, I've read this someplace before. Um, so uh, Alice continues to educate, and, uh, and we're certainly grateful for that. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Arctic. I don't know that I'm going to say anything that's necessarily terribly innovative. Uh, and I don't know that I'm necessarily going to talk too much about energy, but I'm certainly going to talk about shipping and infrastructure. Some of the projects that we've heard described prior to this, um, ice-capable ships uh, and some of the technological things need to be paid for. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. So at, at Guggenheim Partners, we are asset managers. And so what we do is we receive from insurance companies and others uh, large allocations of uh, money to manage and to provide yield, which oftentimes has to be hedged back into a home currency. And so we find that as investors around the world attempt to find yield, one of the places that they can look is infrastructure. We think that infrastructure uh, has all of the attributes of more traditional fixed income investments that large corporates, state-owned enterprise in the People's Republic of China, insurance companies uh, throughout the world have been investing in for years. And so that's what's appealing about infrastructure. <clears throat> As we've heard discussed earlier today, uh, some of these eight ice-capable ships uh, will be plying the waters in two particular routes about which you certainly know a great deal and about which I probably can't tell you very much. But one is the Northern Sea Route, that is over Russia, uh, which is becoming more and more navigable as uh, climate change takes effect. And it's obvious to our friends in Pusan in Southern Korea, uh, if you look at the, the data demonstrated there, that the traveling time from Rotterdam to Pusan can be cut by nearly 30%, actually slightly more than 30%, by traveling through the Northern Sea route. Uh, although we do need the types of ice-capable ships that my colleague was describing uh, earlier in order to ply those waters. Another perhaps less well-known and certainly more perilous route uh, is the Northwest Passage, and that is the uh, pathway over uh, Canada, um, which is much more confined in terms of its uh, navigability, uh, but also offers some reductions, approximately 20% in transshipment. But again, those need ice-capable ships, uh, the kinds of which we've been hearing about earlier today. So <clears throat> there are benefits, but there are also challenges uh, from these shorter supply lines of communication from Europe uh, to East Asia. It's a shorter distance. There are more and more, uh, uh, um, more and more trips being taken, principally through the Northern Sea Route every year. Uh, and transshippers are able to avoid the high fees in the Suez and Panama canals. But there are challenges, the first of which is the capital expenditure for ships such as we've been discussing earlier today. Um, I'm, I'm sure our colleague would agree that these ships um, are, are not inexpensive in their construction. But these can be securitized. Uh, fixed income instruments can be developed. Fixed income instruments can be uh, purchased and held by insurance companies. And this is just like buying a bond. You buy the bond and you clip a coupon for 30 years. And this is you know, our contribution uh, to this sort of endeavor. Uh, there are insufficient search and rescue capabilities, certainly over Russia, uh, a little bit less dire over Canada, but still a problem. And that essentially means that if a ship were stranded in that location, it could take up to eight days uh, to be rescued. Imagine if it were a, a cruise ship. Uh, we would have you know, sort of a galactic level challenge on our hands. There are fewer ports uh, that you can go into for supplies or that lighters can come out to meet you with supplies. Uh, there are navigational hazards. Some of these charts, especially uh, in and around Canada, have not been updated in 25 years. They haven't been updated since the Cold War. Um, <clears throat> and we do need these additional uh, technologies, um, either um, um, uh, 
long range uh, radio technology, um, broadband technology in that area um, that we were talking about earlier today, and then the ships. So there are investment opportunities available here. Uh, there are investments both in securitization of these ships that need to be built. Uh, there are investments that can be made in ports. One of the things that uh, President Grimson uh, has taught us about over the last several years is that there is no deep water port in the Arctic. Uh, and there are competing proposals to build deep water ports in a variety of locations in Alaska, in Iceland, in other locations as well. And those are investment opportunities that can yield return to investors and can also offer uh, needed infrastructure in that part of the world. Um, traveling to this part of the world, I would be remiss if I didn't make mention of the fact that uh, the Chinese government's One Belt, One Road program, otherwise known as the Belt Road Initiative, does indeed have an Arctic component. And we can thank uh, President Grimson uh, for some portion of that. So the, the Chinese have expanded this uh, concept of uh, the Belt and Road, uh, not just uh, throughout um, uh, Central Asia, uh, but into the Arctic region and others as well. So there are investment opportunities that indeed our Chinese colleagues are pursuing uh, in that region. So the challenges that I talked about are not just financial. There are challenges that fall into the environmental and social spheres. And that's one of the reasons that we believe that the type of infra infrastructure we're talking about, whether it's ports or it's ice-capable ships, really need to be developed in a sustainable way. And we think that this is a challenge uh, not just for investors, uh, but for owners and for operators. And we believe that sort of the final frontier of this uh, sustainable infrastructure idea is to assess these projects in their pre-investment phase in four key areas. Uh, the first is environmental. Is the project environmentally sustainable? Uh, and Guggenheim is working with the World Wildlife Fund on that and has been for two years now. The second is, is that project socially sustainable? Is it contributing to the local communities that it uh, professes to serve? Uh, does it comport with the regulatory regime, either in the country that it's being built or the countries whose territorial waters that this ship will pass through? Um, and then finally, is this project economically viable? So these are challenges that investors need to address, and we've begun to address that by partnering with uh, Stanford University and the World Wildlife Fund uh, to conduct an assessment of sustainability standards. This was just published a few weeks ago, um, and. Uh, debuted at, at Stanford University, uh, underwritten by, uh, by Guggenheim and our other partners. And it's a, an attempt, we believe, to converge sustainability standards worldwide. We believe that there is some point in the future where if it's not sustainable, it won't get funded and doesn't deserve to be built. Um, I think there's another side to that coin. If it is going to be funded, and if it is going to be built, it's insufficient to merely claim that the project is sustainable. We need to be able to prove that the project is sustainable. So sustainability data needs to be gathered, needs to be analyzed, and needs to be on the web where it can be interrogated by journalists, academics, local communities, uh, that sort of thing. So the challenges are real, and, and we recognize that. But there are solutions uh, available to us. Not each of these solutions is necessarily financial. Um, Voluntary safeguards uh, in the environmental sphere uh, are becoming more and more commonplace. Uh, Alice kindly uh, made mention of the fact that uh, Guggenheim worked some years ago with a number of partners in the government area and non-government organizations uh, to create something called the Arctic Investment Protocol, which is the first private sector-led um, sort of code of conduct for investing in the Arctic region. We can address this, but we can't do it alone. We'll have to use our partners. Uh, so th th these sorts of things can address the environmental impact, the social impact. We can work with our partners to address the technical specifications uh, that are required. And then an investment will be required by governments in things such as search and rescue. Um, this is just a, a quick snapshot of the project I mentioned earlier, the Arctic Investment Protocol, which we worked on some years ago, and has just recently been adopted uh, 
by the Arctic Economic Council as the guideline for future investment in the Arctic region. And we were pleased to work with our partners on developing that. We think that it's a first effort. We think that it, it deserves uh, improvement. And we look forward to working with the Arctic Economic Council on improving upon that. We also have another project underway referred to as the Arctic Infrastructure Inventory. I see it's been renamed here, Arctic Project Inventory. And it's a compendium of active projects in the Arctic region. Uh, not all of them are investable. Uh, not all of them deserve to be built, quite frankly. But we do think that it offers sort of an authoritative database of where investors may look if they're interested in making an investment uh, for financial return on behalf of their shareholders, their stakeholders, but also if they're interested in making a contribution to the region. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much.